everyone. Boy, it's great to be here. I am Julian, and this is Anusha. And first, before we really start this talk, we're going to queue up a short book trailer, which will give you an exciting overview of this particular story. So if we can get that going, that would be great. Throughout history, some of the greatest achievements, whether in technology, whether in the railroads, have come from the biggest risks. This young man has returned. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Fire. We used to get the ten, give each other different names. We would build a rocket ship. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Wow, he would not believe the vehicle. Holy it's a story of inspiration. It's a story of the fact that you can do anything if your heart and your soul truly desires. Peter Diamandis is the main character. The X Prize, a $10 million contest. He's kind of like this conductor of this great orchestra, and there are all these other players. Burt Rutan and Paul Allen, Mike Melville, set me on an epic journey, a journey that would have me raise a $10 million cash prize and challenge the world to build private spaceships to take me and my friends up into space. This is, in a way, a band of misfits, people who wouldn't follow instructions, fueled by their own passion, and they went ahead and they, they changed history. Passion and purpose is far more important than any equation, far more important than money. The best way to predict the future is to create it yourself. This story I hope is an inspiration to keep taking big risks, whatever you're doing, whatever your spaceship is, so to speak. And at the end of it, you feel like you can put down this book and you can go out and do something impossible in your own life. That's what I hope people get out of it. We used to play pretend, give each other different names. We would build a rocket ship and then we fly far away. We used to dream of outer space, but now they're laughing at the face. So I watch that, I've seen it a half dozen times, but I get emotional just when I'm watching it because of all of the work that went into that and the dreams and the innovations and the fundraising and the ties to history and the making of history. And it really is a story that I am so proud to have been able to tell. It's a story that in my mind combines the best of the human spirit, which, you know, it's about human bravery, and it's about, um, again, technological innovation, and it's about perseverance, grit, and determination. And the title of the book is, as you saw, How to Make a Spaceship. And we thought a lot about that title. Um, and so I'm going to give kind of an overview of the book, and Anusha and I are going to just have a nice conversation, and then we're also going to take questions from all of you. Um, but the title for How to Make a Spaceship, it seems obvious now, but it was a real challenge to come up with the title. And I thought of this in the end because it took all of these people uh, to actually make what became the world's first private spaceship. And it took this little boy named Peter Diamandis who, when he was eight years old in July 1969, he watched Apollo 11 land on the moon. And he was completely transfixed by this image of man stepping foot for the first time on another celestial body. And he did everything from that moment on, from this wide-eyed kid staying up really late to watch this, to try to get to space uh, through NASA, which was the only way to get to space. And he went to MIT, and he went to Harvard, and he founded student space clubs, and he even got his medical degree, even though he had no intention of ever practicing medicine, but he thought it would, it would advance his chance of getting into the astronaut corps. So in, um, after he graduates, he is looking around and he's seeing that he is very unlikely to get to, to space through NASA. 
Uh, the space shuttle was happening, but it was over budget, and to many space enthusiasts, space, space geeks, and he is the biggest space geek, I say that with, with admiration that I've ever met, although Anusha could challenge him for that. <laughs> She'll have to tell you her story, which I love, and she plays a really amazing role in this story. But so Peter looks around and realizes, I'm not going to space anytime soon through these private channels. He is reading a book. There's a great power in the gift of a book. Um, he's reading this book, The Spirit of St. Louis, by Charles Lindbergh. And he has what's a great aha moment. He's reading it, and he realizes something that he had never known before, and that was that Lindbergh flew in 1927, not as a stunt to cross the Atlantic, but nonstop, but to win a $25,000 prize, the Orteg Prize. So he thought, oh my god, look at what happened to Lindbergh. Lindbergh became, upon landing, the most famous man, arguably, in the world. Not only that, more importantly, really galvanized the commercial airline industry. And Peter was reading this book, and he was reading, there were like a dozen individuals, teams, who went after that, spending collectively around $400,000 to win a $25,000 prize. He thought, pretty good deal. So he then has this idea, what if I did the same thing for private space? So in 1996, we flash forward quickly here, he, uh, in St. Louis, going back to where Charles Lindbergh found his backers, he launches the $10 million X Prize. He has 20 people, uh, 20 astronauts on stage with him, Buzz Aldrin, he has the head of the FAA, he has the head of NASA at the time, Dan Golden. There's a really fun scene in my book with Dan Golden and, and Bert Rattan, who comes to play a very big role in this, famous aviation designer, just about getting into a fight on the way to the stage in 1996, because Bert Rattan is challenging Dan Golden why isn't NASA doing this? You know, if you took a percentage of, you know, just the money that you spend on coffee at your centers across the country and spent it on experimental, you know, space flight, it would pay off. Anyway, so Peter launches this $10 million prize, minor detail, he announces it to the world, you know, all these teams from across the globe start um, building spaceships, building hardware, coming up with these teams, dropping out of college, doing all sorts of seemingly crazy things. But Peter does not have the $10 million. So either you're really audacious, or I don't know what the other term would be for this, but um, he did have two people drop off the board because they didn't approve of those, those, uh, that announcement without the funding. So, but what continues from there is he actually thought that the $10 million would be the easiest part to raise. He thought it would be more difficult to get teams building hardware. And it proved just the opposite. He had all of these teams, but he didn't have the funding. So he goes out, and this is where grit, determination, not listening to the naysayers is a huge part of this story. And it's a story whether, you know, as I said in this video, whatever your spaceship is, you know, it takes great perseverance, great determination. Um, so he was told no more than 150 times or something. Not, you know, talking to CEOs of every imaginable corporation and told no again and again and again. And time and again, the two things that he repeatedly was asked, he was asked, why isn't NASA doing this? And what if someone dies? And so finally, this was after 9-11, this was people were telling him basically to um, give up, that this isn't going to happen now. Why is someone going to you know, fund this prize um, now? So he has this, and this is where Anusha enters the story. Um, so he, he's reading, was it Fortune magazine that you were in? So tell this story. He reads this magazine article, about, and Anusha is featured in it, and he's like, oh my God, this is the woman who is going to come to my rescue. So... Enter Anusha. <laughs> um, so uh, around that time, we had. Um, I'm a technology entrepreneur, and also, as Julian said, uh, a big um, space geek, space fan. I also grew up uh, in Iran, uh, dreaming of going to space and and uh, reaching out for the stars. And I had no idea how it would happen, and just continuously, as I was building my career, looking for alternatives. So. Um, 
we had just sold, my husband and I are partners in our business, so we had just sold our technology company uh, a year before that, and um, we finally had some time off, and uh, I was in, uh, you know, we took three months and went to Hawaii to just, you know, we had worked very hard for many years, so we were just taking off. And uh, I had done an interview before leaving, and uh, they asked me what is my passion, and I talked about how I want to fly to, uh, to space, and I want to do a suborbital flight. And uh, Peter reads this interview and makes it his mission to find me and, and, uh, and talk to me about XPRIZE. Because of that one word, suborbital, yes. which is what the XPRIZE was trying to do, to get to 100 kilometers, 62 miles. Ex exactly. And, uh, and he's like, nobody talks about suborbital. She knows what she's talking about. <laughs> so I have to find her. So um, he did, he tried uh, every which way to find us. Of course, we weren't even in, in uh, you know, mainland and um, found my assistant and my assistant called me. He's like, there's a gentleman who's very, very persistent and he wants to meet you. And um, so I asked her, what is it about? And she said, he wants to talk to you about space. And as soon as she said space, I said, okay, the first meeting when I come back, I want to meet him. And we did, we did. That's when history was made and we became partners and stayed partners to today. So all of these people had said no. Was it because of your background as a risk-taking entrepreneur? What role did that play in your actually saying yes or was it just space, space? You saw, and, and Byron Lichtenberg, the astronaut, was there too, right? So were you yeah. kind of like starstruck in every oh, sense of I the word? Oh, I was. Um, so uh, I remember the meeting uh, very well. Um, my husband, my brother-in-law, and myself, we were sitting in the conference room, and here comes Peter with Byron, who's a NASA astronaut, and they come bearing gift, and they know that, uh, you know, all the space geeks love astronauts, and they love astronaut pictures, so they bring all these wonderful astronaut pictures, you know, autographed, and, uh, you know, um, and he starts his PowerPoint presentation and tells us about this uh, amazing idea of a prize. And, you know, just from the get-go, I got very interested because, first of all, I saw the passion in him. It was something that I could relate to very closely, so that was half of the way. And the whole idea of a prize just sounded, as an entrepreneur, very good to me because, you know, as an entrepreneur, you invest your money in one idea, and if the idea doesn't work, you fail. But this was, you know, spreading the risk. You, you didn't have to invest your money in one idea. You let everyone try different things and when they win, you win. And when you have international team of uh, people from all over the world competing for this, you know, your chances are much higher. So to me, it just all made sense. I didn't see why would anyone say no? It was like logical, but... But you apparently. didn't say no. And you said, or maybe when I spoke with, I think it was, I don't know if it was your husband or your brother-in-law, brother but you... It, Someone told me that in that meeting, you could, you know, when you know someone so well, you can look at them and you already know what they're thinking. Yeah. So you were like doing Jedi mind tricks, yeah. or you knew what the other was thinking, at least that you were going to fund this, but you, you had to torture him. Peter for a little bit. Oh, we had to. We had to negotiate with him, make sure he's serious. Yeah. No, we didn't tell him then, but we, we knew this is the right idea. So we thanked him before he left, and he said, we'll get back to, to you, and... Uh, and I remember this because uh, it became something very important for me. Before he left, he said, uh, Anusha, no matter what, uh, you know, if you help me with this and become our partner, and uh, regardless of whether we have a winning ship or not, I'll make sure I'll do everything in my power to help you achieve your dream because I share that dream with you. And, and I remember that, and it was uh, something that stayed with me. And of course, we talked about it after he left, and it was a very quick decision for us. It made you know, a lot of sense, mm -hmm. and we decided to sponsor the prize with him. Talk about when you and I spoke a couple of years ago. I was so captivated by your story of being this little girl growing up in Iran who just would look at the stars with wonder, and there's a wonderful amusing story too where you would sleep out on your grandmother's terrace and yes. what you would have this nightly unexpected prayer yes. of yeah. sorts yeah i i uh, i grew up in iran and i was uh, you know about 16 years old when i left so uh, summer nights when we slept outside uh, and you know i lived through the revolution and the war 
um, in Iran. So, and my family went through a lot of turbulence. So space was this refuge for me, even as a young girl when I looked at the night skies. It was a place where my imagination could just go wild and, and I would go to a different world and I could imagine whatever I wanted. And it's what actually got me interested into science, math and engineering and, you know, helped me build a career in that. Um, and, uh, you know, I always, I, I was a big Star Trek fan and, and I watched Star Trek in Iran and grow, growing up. So I thought to myself when I'm an adult, I would go to U.S. and there will be a Starfleet Academy and I would go apply and, you know, I'll be, a, you know, Mrs. Spock on board Starship <laughs> Enterprise. But, uh, but of course, um, when I came, the reality was uh, of what happened with the space program was very different. And there was like not much was happening beside what happened in the early days of space. So uh, I went through a different career path in, in technology. But it was a dream of mine and something that uh, I would pray for aliens to come and abduct me. And that became like the only way I knew how to go to space as a child. <laughs> Yeah, not everybody has that dream. Aliens, please take me away. Um, so, okay, so now we are in t around, this is 2002 when you partnered with Peter and the X Prize. And so what's happened between um, kind of 2001 and, and then 2004, 2005, when the story ends is you have these teams from across the globe who, to various degrees, are building hardware. You have, you know, a young man in Romania who has dropped out of engineering school um, to build a rocket, basically in his father-in-law's backyard outside of Bucharest. You have uh, rockets being built in rice fields in Texas. You have um, a lot of innovation and various degrees of, of success, uh, danger, but people literally, you know, out there digging their own ditches for, for bunkers, um, who just had this singular dream of a private path to space and were willing to sacrifice everything. Um, a fellow in Argentina named Pablo de Leon, who, very skilled um, aerospace engineer, who, you know, his, his friends, his colleagues told him, this is never going to work. You shouldn't even give it a try. He was in Argentina. He was determined to create a team, which he did, and built a rocket, which he did. And they just did um, a lot of tests of the capsule, but they actually built hardware. I think they had something like $50,000 total. You had a few bigger names where a fellow named John Carmack, who some of you here may know of. <clears throat> Today, he's the CTO of Oculus Rift. He's an absolute genius in the world of programming, video games, Quake, Doom, um, again, now CTO of Oculus Rift. He has always been very interested in rocketry. He formed a team called Armadillo Aerospace in Texas and did some amazing work, but was really interested in figuring out how um, he could apply what he knew about programming for the gaming world and apply it to rocketry. And when I talked with him over the last year or so, he said he's definitely interested in getting back into it once he has this virtual reality thing figured out. But so anyway, so you have all these teams. And then, and then most significantly, you have these mavericks in the Mojave Desert who were led by Bert Rattan uh, who is this, as I said, this famous aviation concept designer. He had a uh, very off the grid, very contrarian thinker. In the 1980s, he had designed the plane, the Voyager, which was the first plane to fly nonstop, non-refueled around the world uh, by his brother, a test pilot, uh, Dick Rattan. Amazing story unto itself. And so he hears of this, and he was actually at that opening ceremony, as I said, in May 1996. And he has it, he also has stars in his eyes. He was a big space geek dreamer as well. So he sets out to build this private spaceship in the Mojave. And so by 2003, he has actually, he's gotten funding from Microsoft co-founder uh, Paul Allen, they didn't announce it for some time. They wanted to keep it under, the under wraps and 
So they had this, you know, truly secret spaceship program going in, in kind of the badlands of the Mojave Desert. And um, his test pilots there are amazing stories. Some of my favorite characters, tr individuals in the book are these test pilots straight out of the right stuff. So there's a time in, two th I think it was April 2003, when Bert Rattan and his folks at Scaled Composites unveil their spaceship. And you were there, right? Yes. So this was, yeah, April 2003, and they had the spaceship behind a curtain, which then they pulled back. So tell us about what, the, what that was like. Um, it was a, a historic moment for a lot of us because we, uh, almost everyone on the board of Higgs Prize uh, always wanted to go to space. And uh, this was like the closest we've ever come to a spaceship that potentially could, uh, could take us and, and help us make our dream come true. So when they were unveiling it, it was, you know, I got goosebumps. I was so excited. I'm like, this is, this is what I'm going to be writing actually in a few <laughs> years, hopefully. So it, it was very, very exciting, and uh, it was beautiful. It, was, it looked nothing like what you imagine a spaceship is. You know, we're used to rockets, vertical rockets going up, and this was a beautiful, amazing, you know, like a plane-like spaceship right out of, you know, Star Trek-type movies. So it was incredible. So you had the, um, the White Knight, which was the, the carrier plane, which would take the rocket underneath up to altitude of around 50,000 feet, and then it would drop launch the, the spaceship. And then from there, it would basically go vertical to the start of space in quite a, quite a wild ride. So the first flight when they tried to go to space was June 21st, 2004. And you had people, tens of thousands of people literally pouring into the Mojave Desert um, to witness this moment in history, which was also incredibly risky. And basically, Bert Rattan was doing a test flight with the world watching. Mm -hmm. And you had this incredible pilot, Mike Melville, who was 63 years old when he first made this attempt to fly to space. Um, he was a guy who had dropped out of high school. He was very unchallenged. He took up piloting midlife. He was a self-taught machinist. He found his calling working for Burt Rattan in the Mojave. And he flew all these crazy experimental planes. I mean, he literally rode on top of a drone uh, an aerial, it was called the Raptor, uh, he rode on top of it. Bert actually put stirrups on the side of this plane, and he was like in somebody else's really scary video game. But anyway, so he, a lot of nutty stories like that. But so this is the guy who Bert entrusted to bring back this homemade spaceship, bring, you know, bring it back safely, come back safely. So this is June 21, 2004, and you were there, right? I so was. So what do you remember from that day? Are your memories stronger for the X-Prize X flights? Yeah, so there were three flights. So to win the prize, which was the $10 million X-Prize, you had to make two flights within two weeks and do it with uh, most of the mass on tack. So we didn't want someone to build two spaceships to, to do this because the whole thing was around making something that's cost effective that will actually make it into a commercial business because we didn't want this to be just a uh, you know, science experiment. So we built a lot of rules around that and, uh, and uh, the, the team, uh, Bert's team, they decided that they wanted to do a test flight before they would attempt an X Prize flight, and the June flight was that. Mm -hmm. um, so we were there. We wanted them to succeed because we wanted them to actually attempt and win the prize, um, and uh, and they they did that. But they were very close. It was like they almost didn't make it to win the X Prize. If it if that would have been the X Prize flight, they probably wouldn't have achieved the first challenge. I think it only made it by like 400 feet yeah. or something like that, which was barely by a nose. Um, funny story that shows kind of the scrappiness of this entire program and how it was really about, um, you know, just inventing kind of on the fly. 
So they were trying to figure out what to do about thermal protection of the spaceship. And um, they had this chemist who was working on these various potions and painting you know, the, the places that got the most heat exposure. And everything, the, the spaceship would come back and it would be cracked and it would look like a dry, dry lake bed and pieces would come off. And the lead engineer on the program finally said to Bert, what are we gonna do about this? We're about to have a supersonic flight. This was before the historic flight, but it's a really funny story. Um, and Bert said, well, what about, I don't know, just slap some body putty on there. And Matt, the engineer, is like, what, body putty? We're gonna go to space with body putty? And Bert said, yeah, we'll give it a try. So you paint it on, it'll dry like hard candy, and we'll see how it works. So Matt goes off and he tests this, and lo and behold, I don't know if you've heard this story, lo and behold, it actually works. And so Matt goes back to Bert, and he's like, oh my God, it worked, it worked. And Bert's like, what worked? And he said, the thermal protection, the body putty. And Bert's like, oh, okay, great. But this has to be high tech. It can't just be body putty. You've got to go to the grocery store. You need to get some herbs and spices. So Matt goes off to the little you know, local grocery store and buys oregano. This is a true story. This is why I love nonfiction. Uh, buys oregano and cinnamon and mixes it and they, you know, they paint that on and apply it for the heat, the thermal protection of the world's first private spaceship. And I was recently with Matt Steinmetz, the lead engineer, and he's like, you know, you could still, if you go to the Smithsonian, which we'll get to, um, you can maybe see little flecks of oregano on the side of that spaceship, which, which I love. But anyway, so you may, okay, so this June 21st historic flight to space, they barely make it. So after that, Bert is, they're all like, we barely made it, and we need to have the ballast sufficient for three passengers. And they just had one, so they had to add 400 pounds, and they needed to come up with more propulsion. And there were all sorts of additional crazy ideas that were passed around for this. Bert at one point thought of strapping on these Sidewinder missiles <laughs> onto the spaceship. And, uh, you know, his test pilots, even Mike Melville, who rode on the plane like, you know, a jockey rides a horse, was like, no way. I am not getting into this spaceship with Sidewinder missiles. <laughs> so they found other ways to get more propulsion. But then you go into, so, so there, there was a rule that this now had to be, for various funding reasons, this had to be won by the end of 2004. And so now it's time. You know, they, Bert Rattan appears to be the only con real contender here. There were a few others who were launching. John Carmack was launching hardware and testing. Um, Dimitri Popescu, the Romanian, succeeded in launching this, you know, kid who dropped out of engineering school succeeded in launching what was the biggest private rocket ever flown from Romania. Amazing story uh, unto itself. But you come into that fall season, September, September 29, uh, 2004 is the first X Prize flight. And when you were there, there's a great moment with you and you see someone wearing a certain baseball cap. Yeah. So early all, morning. Early morning. So we all went to Mojave the night before because this was supposed to be, and the, the flight was in the early morning. And then we all gathered up uh, just coming out of the, our rooms to get on a bus to go to uh, the Mojave airspace. And, uh, and William Shatner, I'm a big Star Trek fan. So I come down and I see William Shatner standing in the lobby with a cap that says Ansari X Prize on it. So I'm like, never in my life I would imagine my name will end up on a cap on the hat of <laughs> the captain of Starship Enterprise. So that's, that was oh a very, my God. very that's a great special moment. moment for me. And I have a picture of it. You do? <laughs> oh, I wish we had it to show. So then you go, and this is, you know, the white night, the mothership uh, was pulled out with the rocket in the dark of night, and thousands of spectators are there for this historic moment, media from across the world. And cool. Peter Diamandis, who had lived this dream really from childhood, you know, it's coming together for this first flight. Um, we were all very nervous. Yeah. yeah. I didn't sleep at all the night before because, uh, you know, if anything went wrong with that flight, oh. it, would, it would be the end of it and all of our dreams would be shattered. So uh, I remember I prayed the entire night to just make sure that oh. even if they don't win, 
for them to come back safe. So it was more for making sure that there was no fatality, no accidents. And we were all very nervous. Very and nervous. then there was a near fatality. It, yeah. This is risky, risky, truly risky stuff. So Mike Melville is back in the cockpit. He was chosen again by, uh, by Bert to fly this first uh, XPRIZE flight. And he was really nervous because every single flight had had anomalies to it. And every single flight had had well, a lot of risk, but this turned out to be the most dangerous flight that he he flew. So, when he got into the into the um, the cockpit that day, and he was nervous, and Bert saw him, and Bert clutched his hand, and this was you know his his best friend too, and he said, you know, fly it like a plane. It's just a plane. Fly it like a plane because that's what Mike knew how to do. And Bert knew how new aviation. So they were banking on their skills to get them through this. And but then so the whole world is watching. And you see the white knight take off, and it took about 50 minutes for it to get five zero for it to get to altitude to follow this flight path. And then the rocket ship is released and it straight up. And then what do you see after that when you have Yes, so we, we were all watching and, you know, at the beginning everything was going great and they almost scrapped that flight because of the wind levels were too high, but oh, then we right. did, they just decided to do it and, uh, and then we were watching it and everything was good and we were just, you know, holding our breath and all of a sudden we see this, the, the spaceship just doing, you know, a corkscrew type of flight. And we're like, is this new design of the flight pattern or what is going on? And some of us were listening on the, you know, calm uh, between um, Mike and, and uh, the control center. And, um, and everyone's like, what's going on? What's going on? And then uh, we hear Mike saying, it's okay, it's okay. And, uh, and even though he got the... Um, you know, command from Bert to abort, mm -hmm. he didn't. Mm -hmm. He decided that I mm -hmm. think I can manage it. Mm -hmm. And uh, because he did, um, they won, mm -hmm. they made it. Mm -hmm. they made but it. that flight, he, that was the one flight he said in all of his career of flying 40 something different experimental types of craft where he thought, he looked out the window and he saw the beauty, the majesty of Earth below and he thought he was going to die and he was filled with not panic, but with this sense of melancholy that this is how it all ends. And there was a two minute period, which must have felt like an eternity mm -hmm. when you're there, where the controls were unresponsive. And he thought that that was it. And he didn't want it to end like that because of all they were trying to achieve and all of the people who were on the ground and all of the work that had gone into this and the dreams and and his buddy, Bert Rattan, was there counting on him. And miraculously, um, you know, the controls came back after a two minute period. It was a cool down period, which he didn't know had already been built in to the spaceship. People forgot to tell him that. <laughs> uh, minor detail. Uh, so then he made it back. But so then for there's a the next flight has to happen under the rules of the X prize within 2 weeks, right? Mm -hmm. So Mike said after that he's you know, he has pay he has he has flown the spaceship more than and there were three pilots who were working for Burt Rattan and he said, you know, I've flown it 70 some percent of the time and we need to give this other pilot, very skilled pilot, great story within the book too, Brian Benny he needs to get back into the cockpit. He had done a great supersonic flight, but had crash landed um, the spaceship, wasn't hurt, but damaged the spaceship. And he didn't want to be remembered for that botched landing, which wasn't entirely his fault. It was some new things they had been testing out on the spaceship. So then Brian Benny, it's his turn for this historic $10 million flight. And you had everybody again back in the desert, and this was, this was the moment, you know, really in history. And everything was, everything was on the line. Mm -hmm. um, October 4th, 2004, all the media back, the hordes of people, uh, the hopes of space lovers really around the world. And so tell us what, what you remember about that day. 
As, as you described it, it was uh, also nerve-wracking, uh, exciting. Everything was riding on it. As, and as you said, we had a deadline that we had to meet uh, by, for, for the prize to be won in 2004. And uh, so we wanted them to succeed. And they had actually, the, the only saving grace was that they didn't wait the entire two weeks to attempt it. So they, within a week, they turned around and they were doing the second flight. And so we figured that even if something goes wrong, perhaps they will have another chance to do it within the rules. But still, we were all very nervous. And uh, this was Brian's uh, flight also, so new pilot. Um, they had said they fixed the issue they found uh, for the, from the first flight, but no one knew you know, if they really fixed it or not. So uh, we were all very nervous. So, um, and a lot of people had shown up mm -hmm. and you know, looking at what's going to happen. And, and we felt not only that it, it wouldn't be just a failure of one spaceship. If we had not succeeded, we felt that it would be the end of you know, what we wanted to promote, which was a whole industry of private spaceships taking regular mm -hmm. people to space. We, we looked at this as just a stepping stone. The first step in opening up um, this whole area for people like myself, who always wanted to go to space, to be able to have an option outside of uh, being part of a government space program. And uh, this would have put an end to all of our dreams. Mm -hmm. But instead, you have this unbelievable, unbelievable victory in terms of Brian Benny, you know, flew this picture perfect, glorious flight and nailed it. I mean, he broke the X-15 record, which, you know, was the military's record, and Bert Rattan was especially excited about that, and it was just an absolute perfect flight, and Brian said he felt like he was guided somehow on that flight. Mm -hmm. um, and so after that, so the X Prize is won, uh, Richard Branson comes in. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about what happens with Richard Branson, the, the um, founder of Virgin mm -hmm. Group, and who looked at the technology of Spaceship One. He was a space geek, a dreamer too. Mm -hmm. And, um, and um, Richard uh, had worked with Bert uh, previously mm -hmm. on some record setting uh, designs that uh, they did. Um, I so think for he, ballooning. Yes. So he was very familiar with, uh, with Bert's work. And um, Peter had approached uh, Richard to fund the X Prize, and he had said no. Yeah, twice. Uh, twice. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, once the prize was won, uh, they announced that they are going to um, commercialize it. Uh, they are going to launch what is known now as Virgin Galactic. And to us, this was uh, a dream come true because the whole point of the prize was for this to be commercialized. And now at this, just the winning of the prize, this was coming true as well. And we knew that this is not going to end here and the story will continue. And that was the biggest gift we could have gotten out of the prize. So it was great to have him there and, and, and um, it, it sort of validated, put that another stamp of approval on what we did. I don't know if you remember this, but you know Richard Branson is a uh, genius at branding, and he, the morning of this second flight, um, Peter arrives. You know, here Peter has like put his blood and soul and and everything into this, and he and Richard Branson had said no to him twice. Just about everybody said no to him at least twice. Um, but so, so Peter arrives early morning, sees, you know, looks out onto the tarmac and sees right in the background, right where the television cameras are aiming their lenses, um, a plane with uh, the Virgin logo. And then he sees that Spaceship One is plastered with the Virgin logo on it too. He's like, what, <laughs> you know, is going on? Because yeah. they had struck a last minute deal. It had been in the works for some time, mm -hmm. but they had really struck a last minute deal between um, Bert Rattan and Paul Allen and Richard Branson, where he was buying the technology rights um, to this particular spaceship. But 
you know, Richard said no twice, but he ends up, you know, he, to funding maybe, a, you know, multi-million dollar prize, the $10 million prize, but is, will end up spending, um, you know, half a billion dollars to keep, to, to build Spaceship Two. So, victory and momentous effort this was something, again, there had been no private path to space. It just didn't exist. And today, you know, you hear about not just Virgin Galactic, but you hear about, obviously, SpaceX, uh, Elon Musk, uh, Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos' company. Uh, there's a fun scene in the book where Peter is meeting with Elon when Elon Musk is just beginning to think about getting into space. And so you're kind of, it's like this great fly on the wall scene. Um, when Elon has just left PayPal and is thinking about this Mars project. Um, but it really was this moment in history where these seemingly impossible dreams became possible, and which is one of the key messages of the book. Mm -hmm. um, just never letting go, never giving up. And Anusha, 10 years ago, was it? You fulfilled another dream. Yes, I... Um with the help of Pete, Peter, yeah. he, he stayed true to his, uh, his word. Um, he continued to introduce me to different people, which eventually allowed me to train uh, as an astronaut uh, with the Russian space program, and I flew to International Space Station in 2006. So it became... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and you spent 10 days at the International Space Station, I right? I spent 10 days, the best days of my life on board, oh. the, space, uh, on board the International Space Station. And, um, something that has transformed my life and changed uh, the way I look at the world and, and uh, my relationship with the world around me and people around me. And, uh, and I continue to be a huge fan of XPRIZE and, uh, on the board and, and uh, we've now grown the prize into a way of using competition and solving even other big problems in the world. And, uh, getting uh, entrepreneurs in their garages and in their uh, in-laws' uh, homes building solutions to mm -hmm. the grand challenges of the world. And I think um, I, am, I feel very fortunate that I met Peter, that our paths crossed. And, I think uh, he feels the same way. Yeah, I think it was, <laughs> it was good for both of us. <laughs> but, but talk a little more about just those 10 days, like a few, a few highlights of what that was like. And also, where, where did you launch from? I launched from uh, Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan so, okay. um, so I went to train in uh, Star City, which is a place where all the astronauts train, and, um, and um, spent uh, about a year training, uh, a little less than a year. And uh, that whole story is also a, a long story, but when I went there, I went as a backup. Uh, I wasn't even supposed to fly, but uh, my stars aligned, and three weeks before the flight, they switched uh, the... the uh, primary crew member and, uh, and I got to go to space. So it was meant to be, I like to think of it. Um, but, uh, well, it you was, made it happen. Um, I did. I, I mean, I went there because I just wanted to be close to the astronauts. And, and, and as long as I was there with the regular real astronauts for a whole year, I would be happy. But then the um, cherry on top was that I got to fly uh, to space station. Um, but it was something that, um, you know, when you were able to see Earth from space, um, it, it really um, transforms your whole view of the world. And as someone who's a big space geek, I have pictures of the Earth and, and images of um, galaxies and plants all over the, uh, my office, my screensaver, everything. Um, but when you see Earth with your own eyes, it really leaves an impression that allows you to really understand um, you know, your place in the universe. It allows you to see our world um, through this lens that tells you this is our spaceship where we're all basically flying to space together. And all those differences and, and boundaries and, and walls all disappear and melts away. And you only see our planet and uh, you understand the connectedness of everything. And, uh, and it stays with you even when you come back. And, and, uh, and I think it was one of the greatest gifts and moments in my life. And uh, it, it's a gift that continues to uh, give to me and, and uh, it has shaped what I do 
um, now. Amazing from this little girl who dreamed of going there and prayed that the aliens would take her away. <laughs> she got there on the her own. The Russian took me away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, also such an empowering story for women, young women, to hear as well about making you know your dreams come true. Beautiful story. So I think we are going to open it up for questions from the audience. Two quick questions. First, it's been 12 years, according to your numbers, since uh, uh, Branson's going to take people up to space. What's happened in those 12 years to prevent that from happening? And number one, and number two, I wasn't clear on something else. Did you and your family fund the $10 million? Um, so the first question, um, what happened is that Branson decided that our original design was for three people to fly to space. So he decided for a viable commercial program, a bigger uh, ship is needed. So what they built is now what's called White Knight 2 and Spaceship 2, which is much bigger. Uh, and when you go from three passenger to, I think, seven passenger uh, uh, design that they have, the magnitude of problem uh, also exponentially increases. So they have been designing around that and building a whole new plane um, to, to fly the spaceship to. And they have, they're very close, I believe, in the next probably 12 to 24 months, we will see uh, a commercial flight. They have done a lot of test flights. Um, and they have hard, I mean, they've flown the spaceship separately, they've flown the White Knight separately, they've done even uh, joint flights. So I think they're very, very close. And not only um, Virgin, but also now Blue Origin and a few other companies have designs for suborbital and orbital flights. So all great advances have been made. One thing we didn't talk about, one of the biggest achievements of the prize was the fact that we were able to change regulation. The biggest hurdle, nobody could even do these test flights before because there was no regulatory framework to allow for this to happen. Only governments were able to fly spaceships. So changing that whole um, framework allowed for companies like SpaceX and uh, a lot of the new space companies to exist and be able to do what they're doing today. In terms of the funding, we provided the sponsorship, not not the entire 10 million, but we provided the sponsorship which allowed for this to be funded through um, an insurance program that they had put together before we even joined the, uh, the, the, uh, the X-Prize. A nutty, another nutty part of the story of how they ended up funding it with this hole-in-one insurance, basically people betting against them that they would win it. And so they would have to, they paid it out when they did. Yeah. Peter loved that part. He's like, yeah. everybody's been betting Very against close. me from the start. Now yeah. I could actually fund the prize by people betting against me. <laughs> what was your biggest physical challenge in the training? And what was your biggest psychological adjustment in the experience in, of being uh, in the space, space. Uh, station? Um, so the physical training was uh, very rigorous. Uh, it was uh, every day, basically, from 8 o'clock in the morning to 7 p.m. We had classroom training, um, physical training, um, just simulation training, different things. Um, but, you know, to me, it was not difficult because I, I was just having fun, learning a lot of new things and... and uh, you know, again, I was with astronauts doing the training, so I was excited about it. Um, so it was a lot of long hours, and the, the most difficult part was that I was away from my family during the entire time by myself uh, in this basically military camp where everyone trains. And, uh, you know, I was in Russia at one of their military camps where, you know, you turn on the water and brown water comes out. And so a lot of just basic things were not available. Um, but um, in terms of what uh, was most difficult part of the psychological part of it, um, it was after I had the experience and all of my life I had this like big goal in front of me and I was sort of driven to it. And uh, when the, um, you know, when the time was coming to an end, the 10 days was coming to an end, I was returning, I sort of had this big hole in my life. That I, I was depressed. It was like I had this amazing experience. I didn't want to leave. I wanted to stay in space, stay on the sp uh, space station. 
And that whole adjustment when I came back and, and for a while I felt like, you know, I had seen something so beautiful. I wanted to sort of uh, instantaneously transfer this image to everyone around me. And I felt like everyone's walking in their sleep and I've been awakened and I, I didn't know how to communicate that to everyone else. And that was the most difficult part. Hi. Um, I was wondering, as the XPRIZE Foundation has sort of uh, expanded and diversified, um, how much you're looking at uh, sort of biotechnology and synthetic biology prizes, and whether you ever talk to the people who run like the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition, things like that. Um, so, as uh, a rule, we don't necessarily um, dictate an approach to coming up with a solution. So what we do is we uh, design the challenge around a problem that needs to be solved uh, and we design some parameters to make sure whatever the solution is, it can actually be commercialized. Again, we don't want someone to come up with a solution that's so expensive it can never reach the hands of people who need it. So that, those are the only conditions we put around this. Um, but how you approach it, uh, it's up to you. So right now we have uh, prizes that we've launched in energy, um, in, in, um, we have a Google Lunar X Prize, we have what we call a Tricorder X Prize, which is one of my favorites, and you can tell there are lots of uh, Star Trek fans in, in X Prize. So it's a handheld device um, that would allow people to um, you know, diagnose 10 um, different types of diseases uh, better than um, 10 board certified doctors with a handheld device. Um, we have, uh, we had a, a Nokia sensing prize, which was very cheap um, sensors that can use a mobile phone and with saliva or blood be able to diagnose a lot of different uh, uh, infections. Uh, we have uh, Ocean Health Prize uh, for ocean acidity measurements at a very low price. Uh, we have just announced a Carbon X Prize. We have uh, two education prizes, one uh, for kids and one for adult literacy. Am I missing any? I think those are the ones that mm -hmm. are active. But if you go to our website, and they're all global prizes uh, for anyone to compete and, and to participate. Hi. How much did it cost to win the X Prize, and how did they get their funding? So each team, uh, you know, they had their own budget. As Julian said, I think um, Bert and Paul Allen spent about twenty-five million dollars uh, to win the ten million dollar prize. Mm -hmm. um, well, Paul Allen, yeah, he bankrolled it for around for, twenty-six million dollars, yeah. which was a lot of money, but a fraction compared to what, what? NASA would spend on. Exactly. A space vehicle, so. But then there were teams that, like the Argentinian and Romanian team that spent very little. Um, some of them, you know, their neighbors would bring them scrap metal and bits yeah. and pieces of things for them, cook them food. So each team had their own different budget. One thing that I loved about the uh, competition was truly a, what they call a co-opetition, where Sometimes you would gather the teams in one location to, uh, you know, showcase what they were working to help them raise funds. And, you know, if someone had something that wasn't working, then someone from the other team would come and lend them something or help them fix the problem. So it, was it wasn't very like collaborative. Very, yeah. very collaborative. It wasn't like, because they all knew, everyone uh, ultimately wanted to go to space. So even if they didn't build it, someone else built something affordable that would have helped them as well. So it was very heartwarming to see them work together. You mentioned that being um, in space, being in space, you mentioned how that changed your perspective um, on life and how you were going to live the rest of your life. I was just wondering, um, have you, it, it, it must be a very personal emotion to experience. Did you anticipate that at all? And uh, have you spoken to other people who have been in space and have they had the same reaction? Um, so it, it, it was very emotional. I did not expect it to be honest with you. Um, but I remember uh, clearly like the first time I saw Earth from space was uh, right after launch. It takes about maybe 20 minutes to get to um, orbit and be able to actually unstrap. Um, and uh, I remember I just floated off of my seat, which I was, you know, just fascinated by the fact that I was floating. 
but just slowly floated up to the window, the porthole in the capsule. I was still in the capsule, which is a very, very tiny capsule. I was able to see Earth from space and, and I was very happy, but I was crying and I couldn't even understand why I was crying. I was laughing, I was crying at the same time. And it was this emotional experience of looking at Earth and feeling like this is this beautiful living thing in front of me. And this, that I, I almost felt like this energy, this warmth coming from Earth, which is the life on Earth. And there's nothing around it. And when you talk to astronaut, every astronaut I've talked to had similar experiences where they felt this living, beautiful world in front of them and, and uh, an experience that has also transformed their life. So many astronauts feel that way and we've just come up together with a coalition called the Constellation to take this message in a better way to communicate it to the whole world. We have time for one more question right up here. This is a very quick question, but um, how many other women were training with you in Russia in the astronaut center? So um, at that time, uh, when I was training, there was only one other uh, woman who then she became the first commander, female commander of the space station, Peggy Whitson. So I was training with her actually, uh, and I was very lucky to have that experience. So just some numbers around women in space program. About, over f about around 550 people have flown to space from the beginning of times when we started going to space. And 10% women. Um, the first woman who went to space was a Russian uh, woman, uh, Valentina Tereshkova. Uh, but then since then, they only had two women in space program and no one in the recent years. So when I went there, actually, they didn't want me there. And they did whatever they could to uh, dissuade me from staying and doing the, the training which, you know, they just didn't know me well enough. <laughs> and they gave up. But they, they, they became good friends after a while, after I convinced them that I'm there to stay. Uh, and, and what happened, because a lot of media in Russia covered my uh, uh, participation in the program. So now they have new um, cosmonauts, female cosmonauts in the program. So they actually had uh, two or three more people joined recently in the program. So it was good to see that change happen. In Russia. So thank you all very much. Uh, thank you.